My name is Maxwell from Z100 here in New York, but here. I'm sharing the stage with the gentleman who is responsible for making this all a reality, and uh, congratulations on it all. Let's give it up for Charlemagne the God, please. <laughs> Joining us on this panel, uh, we have some brothers here that are going to really uh, make us feel as amazing as they've been uh, chatting with us all backstage. Um, goodness, let's start with Jay Barnett, lifestyle therapist and author and speaker. Where's Jay Barnett? Let's bring this heel up to the stage. How you doing, brother? <laughs> Good King to break bread with you, man. Have a seat. Relax, relax. All right, now, come on now. Cave of Dullum. We need to make sure that y'all understand this author, this speaker, this founder of this transformational training academy, Mr. Jason Wilson. To the Here. stage. Let's welcome him as well. King, King. Appreciate you being here. Appreciate the conversation backstage as well. We're going to take that to the stage here in just a second. And last but not least, he is an NFL veteran. He is an entrepreneur. He is the CEO and founder of Alchemy Health. Please welcome Mr. Ryan Mundy to the stage. Here. Big Rye. Thank you for being here, Ryan. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Now, uh, <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. I need one of them alchemy hoodies, you know what I mean? For real, for real. Charlemagne the God, man. Come yeah. on, dude. Thank you for allowing us to have this conversation. No, man. I'm th thankful that we're, you know, alive and able to have this conversation on this beautiful Sunday, this World Mental Health Day. And these brothers right here, every single one of these brothers on this stage inspire me in a real way. So I'm just great to, I'm, I'm grateful to be able to have this conversation with y'all today, man. So thank you for coming. Yes. And, and I want to start with Jason, Mr. Jason Wilson. Jason, why does subscribing to society's view of a real man do more harm than good? That's a very good question. Um, it does more harm because society's definition of a man is limited. Um, as a black man, as what I'm learning now is just not our issue, it's a man's issue, but We've learned, we've allowed ourselves to be defined by the culture, and the culture defines men only by masculine attributes. And when we only can live under masculine attributes such as strength, uh, power, and protection, etc., we really can't be the nurturers we were created to be. We can't be compassionate when we need to be. We can't be long-suffering or patient. And as a result of that, when we feel that we're becoming weak, which we all will at times become weak, we feel that we're not men anymore. And then you wonder why the suicide rate amongst black men is the highest in history right now. And so it's truly detrimental for a man to only be masculine. Now, is there, is there a such thing as toxic masculinity? Absolutely not. As I was sharing with one brother, if this building was on fire, we all need to be exuding masculine attributes to get up out of here to save our lives. However, a man becomes toxic when he allows his emotions or he allows this masculine mandate to prohibit him from being comprehensive, basically expressing the other emotions that he's been given. And so my definition is a comprehensive manhood, of becoming a comprehensive man, someone who's courageous, but also compassionate, strong, but sensitive, a man who can freely live from the good in his heart instead of his fears. Yeah. Anybody else want to expound on that? Yeah. Feel free. <laughs> <laughs> Well, one of the things that you were telling me backstage and, and what we were really uh, digging into is, is the ability to be willing to feel, to be vulnerable. Um, you know, so, so with that, uh, you know, how important is it for us to be willing to go there in order to release some of this toxic energy that, that could be and, and is very much built up inside of us as black men? I think part of willingness is also having permission Okay. Yeah, many of, many of us as men have not had permission to feel. I think we often have been um, led to believe that our emotions are invalid. And something that I shared recently, my mother just discovered me on YouTube. So, <laughs> so she's 63. So she says, hey, I saw this video of you talking about some stuff with your dad. And she said, 63, she said, Jay, I didn't know men had emotions. Wow. And she told me, she said, I apologize for not understanding that you were going through and had feelings too. And I think part of us as men being able to feel is having the space to feel and giving permission that it's okay to acknowledge that your feelings and your emotions are real rather than just kind of, you know, uh, avoiding it as most of us have, have done. Well, you know, it's, it's uh, and I'll, I want to jump in front of you, Jason, but it's an important thing that we had here that I wanted to ask you later is, is 
what prompted you to begin your healing journey? I mean, having, having heard that from your mother just recently, where did that inspiration come from for you to start your healing journey? Well, I, you know, I, I, on both sides of my family, I have a large group of men on my dad's side. And I knew I didn't want to be like any of those men. And so the healing for me had more to do about who I wanted to become because when I stopped focusing on, I don't want to be like my dad, I don't want to be like him, the more I became him. And so healing for me became personal because I said, how can I change not only the generation, but how can I change these dysfunctional patterns of these men with multiple children, with multiple women, all of this, I mean, just so many toxic and dysfunctional patterns of behavior. So for me, I said, in order for me to become different, I'm gonna to have to change my thinking and unlearn what I had learned. Wow. Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> I, want to, I want to follow up with Ryan. I want to talk to Ryan. Like, how, how do we advance that conversation for, for black men, Ryan? The conversation about feelings, the conversation about mental health, our emotions, all of that. Yeah, I, I, I want to go back to the, uh, what Jay was talking about around permission. Um, you know, there's, it, there's two ways you could look at it. Permission externally, but then also, like, giving yourself permission. Um, that's where it started for me, like, you know, my background is in athletics and, you know, there's a persona and prestige and everything that kind of comes with it where people will look at you and say, like, you're not supposed to feel like X, Y, and Z. And that's an external expectation that I'm now putting on myself, which isn't accurate or fair or true or allowing me to, do, to be the best and highest version of myself. And so for me, you know, it really starts, and for us, I believe it starts around giving yourself permission and not looking externally and figuring out like how, what standard you need to measure up and meet externally, but really setting the standard internally for yourself so you can unlock yourself um, and take that first step on your healing journey. I wanna ask you, Charlemagne, kind of that same question, man. When did you find that, especially in the position that you hold, not only with the, with the, with the radio show, but the television and, and you're, uh, you're standing here in, in, in our job, when did you find it that you were able to give yourself the permission to heal, to, to be yourself, to be vulnerable, to be open and honest as you do with so many of the, the fans and listeners of, of what you do? Um, I don't think I had a choice. I didn't, I didn't have a choice for myself just because like, you know, if you pride yourself on being um, authentic and you pride yourself on, on being honest, if, you're, if, if, you, if you've gotten caught up in being a character to yourself and you know you're wearing a mask, that mask gets heavy. Yeah. You know, and you know, if I, if I can't show up and pretend to be anything that I'm not. So I don't even know if it was something I, I, I set an intention to do. It might have it might have been more so like a cry for help, you know, wow. letting people know that I deal with anxiety and depression and things of that nature. And then, you know, running across brothers like this, you know, they give me the courage and the strength just to be more open and be more honest. So, I mean, it's still a constant process. I can't sit here and act like, you know, I'm comfortable still having these conversations, but you know, they yeah. always say that, you know, you find growth in, in uncomfortable, in, in uncomfortability. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, kind of applause for that. Um, bringing it back over to Mr. Wilson here, um, talking about society's view of, of a real man, air quotes with that right there. Um, how, how does subscribing to that, how does that create more harm than good? Well, I use myself as an example and kind of just piggyback off the previous question. Um, what encouraged me to start my journey was that I was about to lose my marriage and my family. I saw that I'm searching for love, but when I stepped in the mirror, I hated who I should be loving. And I didn't, so this hate towards myself, I started giving it to my wife the impatience that my father had towards me or the, the words, condemning words that he spoke over me, I did to my beautiful daughter. So it got to one point where me and my wife had we reached an impasse, like, look, we gotta figure something out here. And at that point, I said, I could not afford to lose what the Most High had given me because I'm not willing to do the work that's needed within me. And so, Using myself as an example, I was in the black community, the gold standard for us was the hypermasculine black male. And I became, I tried my best to be that. I was no thug, but I tried my best to be a thug. 
And then it wasn't until recently until I realized truly what a thug was, I created an acronym for the word thug. It's a traumatized human unable to grieve. So when you have, when you have young men who walk around with ticking time bombs of self-hate in them, Anything could happen at any given moment and they snap and explode. We've been trained as men to only operate that way. What would we say to each other if you lost your mother and you're crying at the funeral, I say, stay strong, bro. That's the wrong, why would I tell this brother to stay strong and he needs to grieve? When we tell our boys to stop crying, we're, we say, he's toxic, he's toxic. We're literally making them toxic because Dr. William Frey discovered the tears from emotional stress or trauma not only contain 98% water, but also stress hormones. They get excreted from the body when we cry, and that's typically why we feel better. I can't tell you how many times I go to my mother's grave and just cry because I've been conditioned to bottle all of this stuff up. Even Drake says, uh, I pop bottles because I bottle my emotions. And so we've been conditioned to do that. So back to the point of why uh, is detrimental to men. My wife talking to me, and my son is right next to him. We're in the kitchen. I say, I need to spend more time with my son. I really want to spend more time with him. So my wife says, I hope one day you have that same desire for me. But because I'm not a verbal processor, and I'm only a masculine male, I heard something else I wasn't doing right. So that anger I wanted to express, I really, what was inside was hurt because I love her, but it sounds like you're telling me something else I'm not doing, I'm trying my best, and before I knew it, I hit the refrigerator. Again, dominant, dogmatic, stand up, yelling at my queen. And I vowed that day, I said, I would never make her feel that way. She's supposed to be protected and feel safe around me. I am a warrior, I wanna be comprehensive. So when you're only conditioned to be dogmatic and bold and strong and assertive at all times, you're stuck in what I call lion mode. When you need to be the lamb as well, you got to know how to go to the lion and back to the lamb. Lion mode is being stuck in fight or flight. You're stuck. You're constantly dogmatic. Who around me? Who doing this? I'm going to wreck this, whatever. When you need to reset to the lamb, so I could have said, dang, bae, it hurt, because all I'm trying to do is love my son. I want to spend time with him more, because I ain't have my dad. Yeah. Then now my wife can drop her guard, because why? Because she's loving, she's a nurturer. She's hearing a language that she understands. She's not going to fight me fist to fist. You understand? And so she sees that, and because I became comprehensive, so when you're only masculine, that's what happens. You think you identify, like when you say, bro, that black men don't cheat. You need to keep saying that. That's why I love you, how you transformed as a man, brother. We don't say those things enough. And so now I got to worry about, my wife tells me everything I need to hear. No woman in here could tell me something that would make me feel better about myself. Because I've allowed this woman access to a place in my heart that this world told me that no woman should have. So when a man can only be that way, he hinders his marriage, he hinders fatherhood, he hinders the community, right, and this man. community needs to feel our love. That's what it is. That's what it is. Thank you, King. Man. Hold on. Yeah. And I also, too, you know, to talk about, you know, uh, the, the, the perception of men or the stereotypes of yeah. men, the whole tough guy image. Jason will beat your ass now. Jason is a, <laughs> how many degree black belt are you, Jason? I've trained in many martial arts. There's a lot of martial yes. arts. Yes. <laughs> just, just, just let that be known, okay? <laughs> now, Jay, simple question. How important is it for men to heal? Yes. Man, it's so important for us to heal because when you look at the world around us and look at our community, everything that has been normalized, everything that has been common practice has been driven from the performance of men. How does men show up? How our women are viewed and protected determines how men show up. What does a man say? And it's so important for us as men to heal because it impacts not only our families, but it impacts our communities. And just think, and, and I said this previously, George's Floyd's death 
was so monumental for us as black men because it allowed the world to see us as human beings. And now that the world eyes is on us and as we're healing and as we're going through this journey, it's now important for us to begin healing our boys because our boys are emulating exactly what they see men do. And the importance of us as, as men uh, to heal is also to change the DNA. See, we don't realize that trauma will alter your DNA. Stress will alter your DNA, your genetics. So when we begin to heal, it's going to change how our children develop. It's going to change how they see themselves. And they'll be, be able to see themselves from a healed lens and not from this traumatic, dysfunctional lens where we're taking our trauma into the world and we're showing up to the world with a question. And when we begin to heal, we can show up to the world with an answer. And that's why it's important for us to heal as men. Now, that importance, as, as you said, is utmost, but also the idea of it being a journey. And, and, and I want to come to you with this one, Ryan. How... Um... I guess, like, what would, how does someone start that journey? What advice would you give to someone who is, who is ready or maybe on the cusp of being ready, but they want to take that first step in, in the right direction on this journey? Yeah, I think it goes back to my previous point around, like, actually giving yourself permission. Uh, once you empower and equip yourself with confidence and belief uh, and conviction, uh, then that is the power and the fuel that you need to take that first step. Because the reality in this current healthcare system, that first step is very, very difficult to take. Right, where every, you know, the buzzword phrase right now is, go see a therapist. That's really, really hard to do. Like, most of us don't know what we're looking for. We don't know what credentials we need. Uh, if we find somebody, it is really cost prohibitive to go see a therapist. One in-person therapy session will cost you at least $100. Right? There's time constraints, there's geographic constraints, and specifically for our community, finding a culturally competent therapist is really, really difficult to do. That is my personal journey. Um, you know, I went through at least four or five different professionals before I saw, uh, or for, before I found somebody who, who saw me as Ryan Mundy, the black man, the husband and the father, and no longer Ryan Mundy, the athlete. And I thought to myself, I said, you know what, like, you know, I have, I've been blessed and fortunate to have resources, and I'm still having these troubles. Imagine what it's like for, you know, the folks on the south and west side of Chicago. Imagine what the, they really need help and support, right? But it all, for me, again, circles back and saying, like, look, let's give ourselves permission. And then it's like uh, events like this, platforms like Alchemy, et cetera, in which we need to start thinking about democratizing access to real care. Um, that is always and forever will be a barrier in, in general for the healthcare system, but it's particularly compounded for our community. And so uh, we really need to be rallying around each other, supporting one another, you know, at every twist and turn, because in, the inevitable will always happen. Uh, but we need to rally amongst each other as a community and make sure that we're empowered to take that first step and be equipped for the journey ahead. Word. I, I want to ask all three of y'all then, like, so, so what was that first step? Like, what was the first thing you did that got you on that journey towards healing? Of course, it's acknowledgement, the acknowledgement that, you know, you're not okay, the acknowledgement that you want to be better, but what was the first thing you did? Because that's, that's one of the reasons I wanted to have this event, to give, introduce people to people and resources, but what is that first thing you should do? I went to Google. I, I typed in black therapists, uh, black therapists near me, mental health, support, that's literally was the first step for me. And even in that process, it's still really hard to, to get access to the right information or get the right results that you're looking for because the, the landscape in its current form is highly fragmented. You know, there's, there's less than 4% of clinical professionals or black or of color. There's a huge supply and demand imbalance um, and it just doesn't meet the need for our, uh, for our community currently. And because like conversations like this are happening, as the stigmas fall, then the demand increases, right? So more and more people are, w are starting to show up and want to take that first step. Um, but if you go to Google and you, you know, type in black therapists or mental health support, you know, it, it's a really, really rough and rocky start. And that's why going back to that first comment around just like giving yourself permission, that confidence, because that journey is not, it's not easy. What about you, Jason? What was your first thing? Um, I was thinking as you were talking, um, what's interesting, we searched for black therapists 
because we think that, you know, if you're black, you understand my experience and what I'm going through, which makes sense. And my wife, when we were considering separation, she says, hey, I got someone for us to see. His name is Dr. Tim Bro. And the funny thing about it, I thought he was black because it was Bro in his name. And so when I called him, I heard his voice. I said, are you, are you African-American? He was like, no. I'm like, well, how can you understand what I'm going through? I quickly realized he didn't need to understand my experience. He needed to understand the effects of trauma. When I got with him and my wife, we did cycle, intense psychotherapy. Our first session was seven hours, I believe. For me, that was the major step that transformed not only our marriage, but me personal. So just taking what you desire deep inside. Like, I want to be the best husband I can be. So the first step was moving past my own fears, moving past my own negative thoughts of myself and what I haven't done and say, hey, let me think on what I can do and who I can be. And so my first step was to go to psychotherapy with my wife and then eventually he's become a great friend of mine who I talked to like actually just before I came here. Cause like you say, this is, there's no point of arrival. Do not be deceived. You're constantly gonna have to wage this war within every day. As soon as you think there's an end point, you'll always be discouraged. And so that was my first step, was just surrendering to my deep desire, pushing through my fears, and the rest is pretty much history. That's why I'm on this stage. Pretty All right. So we got two therapies. Jay, what about you? For me, it was uh, my ex fiance We had this disagreement. Um, I was engaged about what, 12 years ago, and I, we had a blow up, and I blew up on her. And she says, Jay, you need help. You have anger issues. And this is after football. And, and, and the, the hard transition as athletes is that, you know, you're, you're trained to react, not respond. Respond is a level of processing. React is, is it's kind of like what you've been trained to do. And so I started looking for a, a therapist and a friend of mine uh, gave me information to this Christian counselor, um, older uh, black gentleman. So I went in to see him and started talking, and I was trying to, having a hard time filling them out, and the brother went to the Bible, and literally, I said, bro, my dad a pastor, man. I, this, like, this, I said, I don't need this Bible right now, man, because I was struggling so hard with suicidal thoughts, and then I went to a white therapist, and, and if you remember the movie Antoine Fisher, where Derek Luke was in there, like, for three sessions, we literally sat in there for like three sessions where I didn't say nothing, Ryan. I was just like, he's like, yeah, whenever you're ready to start. So one day he asked me, he's like, so tell me why you not being um, signed in to the team, why did that affect you? And tears started rolling down my eyes. He said, why does football mean so much? And it broke something in me, man. And uh, alluding to what Jason said, what challenged me and charged me to go back to school at 33 was that I understood that not only just athletes, but so many black males needed a safe space. And the, the black counselor was great, but what he was providing, I, I didn't need at the time. And so many, so many times, it's not scriptures, it's context. And I needed context on why was my dad abandoning me showing up in my adult life through my suicide thoughts? And that led me, and after I started to open up, man, I was calling him like, hey, when is our next session? So, cause, and and, and was, was, was transforming because my mother, I told her I was in therapy, she literally said to me, bro, she said, why are you in there telling this white man all your business? <laughs> I said, mama, I'm trying to get some help. <laughs> so I didn't care what color he was. <laughs> I was gonna tell somebody. So, so, so real quick, Max, so therapy you would say is the best entry point? Huh? Is therapy the best entry point for anybody that wants to start their healing journey? Absolutely, therapy, and then of course, uh, facilities like Inception, if you can find one, you know, um, neurofeedback training, uh, what is it called, uh, self what is it? The Magnosphere. Magnosphere, the therapy. floating. Okay. Flotation therapy is amazing because it finally allows your body to shut down. So even when you're laying on a mattress, you're still conscious that you're laying against something. But when you're in a float tank, it's filled with Epsom salts, so you're floating, 
and it allows all of your sensories to finally shut down and you're able to really relax. And so definitely, not just therapy alone, it has to be comprehensive in its approach. And then one of the things I tell people when I mentor young boys, I want you to go to a period without coming to me because I got to teach you how to walk on your own. Like some of the therapists, they come to me and I need them. They're like, look, can I talk to you for a moment? Because we, we're wearing them down as well. Like that's, some, that's why I'm so glad you're using your platform, brother. It's, this is something, a dream for me to see happen. But our therapists, they need a break. They need to see if we're going to actually apply what they're teaching. And so to give them a moment, they, thank you, sweetheart, thank you. I just left pri private practice <laughs> for that reason. So yeah, so it's not therapy, application, of course, treatment like inception, any of that, working out, uh, yoga, stretching, it's so much you can do to help your mind and your body. We, we have a little bit of time left, and I know this question, we can probably just talk about this one question um, for hours, but um, the one that I had highlighted on here, and we want to say with you, Mr. Wilson, here is, uh, why is mental health important? That, well, I guess it's a two-pronged question. That, but also, uh, what, what should define us as men? Nothing. Mm. As, soon as, we, uh, uh, as soon as we allow a definition to define us, we become limited. So we had a saying in martial arts that we're anything and everything we have to be at any given moment. So when our instructor asked us, he says, who are you? You heard king, father, protector, provider. This is, he just started laughing. He it's said, too much. Too yeah. much. It's like, dude, you're anything and everything you have to be at any given moment. In fighting, I may need to strike you at one moment. I may need to grapple. I need to evolve. I may need to protect them one day. I need to love them one day. I need to nurture them one day. My, and, and this is advice I give for men to break free from what I call misconstrued masculinity. Start running towards or freedom from emotional incarceration. Start running towards the areas in your life that hurt you the most. The places in your life that make you feel non, what they call non-masculine emotions, because I don't even believe in that, because if you say feminine, feminine emotions are nurturing, th that means that if they exude masculine, yes. it's like we're always trying to name something to categorize things. Let's just be and live as human beings. Yeah. So... When, um, man, I, I got lost in that for a moment. Um, we right there with you. Yeah, so where was I? I don't know, I, that right there just took me, man. But anyway, what I'm saying is, is that when you become comprehensive, oh, running towards the pain, there we go. So my mother uh, was diagnosed with dementia. And I used to get so, be so judgmental when people wouldn't come see senior citizens in the nursing home or at my mother had to get admitted to the hospital often for a psych evaluation. And one day, a, a big, huge white guy come in, motorcycle driver, sit next to me and just break down crying. He says, this is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. He says, I can fight, I've been in this and that, I've done this. He says, but to see my mother deteriorate before my eyes is shaking me to my core. Because as men, we're not used to accessing the other emotions that the Most High has given us, we can't even show up like 100% to some serious situations or where they need us to be nurturing and understanding. My wife had five miscarriages. I was checked out because I didn't know how to cry. I didn't know how to express it. We were just saying we didn't even know how to convey it to our daughters because we taught we're supposed to be strong all the time. But when you go as a man, when you start going to those areas to your grandparent who's aging or someone else that pulls at your heartstrings, now you allowing yourself to live from the good in your heart. Yes, you need to be the protector, provider, making sure the pharmaceutical companies aren't hurting her, Jason. But are you patient enough when she asks you a question 32 times, you ask her to repeat it the 33rd time? Hmm. Will you be there enough to file her nails even though you think that's weak? Will you rub her feet? I became a manicurist. I became a massage therapist. I rubbed her scalp until she fell asleep. I sat with her, I cried with her. And because of that, now I can really live from the good in me. And so anger is powerful. We talked about that. And a scene, this is the key though. When you know how, when you don't suppress your emotions, you know how to rule them when they rise. 
But as soon as you suppress them, something happens, you become its slave. And it's the scene in the Avengers I love when uh, Iron Man was bringing the, trying to get Bruce Banner to come fight this big alien creature. And Bruce Banner, just Bruce Banner still, he walking toward the alien like, I got it. And Captain America was like, yo, don't you, don't you want to turn green? He said, no, don't you need to get angry? He says, that's my secret, Captain. I'm always angry. So I ask my boys whenever I'm speaking, or even right now, if I ask you, am I angry? You say, no, you seem cool. I'm very angry because I'm tired of seeing men waste their lives by living limited lives. I'm here, I took the sacrifice to be here because of your sacrifice, because of all these other brothers' sacrifice. It's that same anger that ignited movements across this world. But when you learn how to control it, when it arrives, you become its master instead of it mastering you. Man. Well, I'm going to leave that last one for you, Charlemagne. I'm going to let you wrap this up too, bro, because no. I'm telling you, man, I'm, we, we have a private session because this is amazing to hear the, the, the four of y'all speaking. I want to I wanna get you to wrap this up, Charlemagne, with what, why is mental health important? Man, mental health is important because, you know, I just, I just want to be the best version of myself at all times. And, you know, I want to yeah. be, I know that if I'm being the best version of myself, then I'm being the best husband to my wife, I'm being the best father to my kids, I'm being the best, you know, friend to my folks, I'm being the best family member, I'm being the best public servant. I know that if I show up and, you know, really take care of my mental and emotional health, then I can really, 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 really fulfill the destiny that I think God has for me on this planet. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, well, so. well thank, thank you for being such a, an advocate. Thank you for being in the position that you're in, allowing young brothers like myself to look towards a, a positive beacon, to, to know that you're willing to go there, it's okay for me to go there, especially, like I said before, on the platforms uh, that, you, that you navigate through, man. It means a lot to us all, so I just want well, to tell yeah. you that much. I'm not, I'm not an expert at anything. These are the experts. <laughs> I just got some experiences, and you know, I, I thank God that I'm in a position that I can help amplify these brothers and, and you know, these sisters, because this, these are the healers. These are the people yeah. that, you know, when, when y'all come to me and y'all be like, yo, how can I, Start my healing journey. I'm pointing y'all in the direction boom, boom. of one of these brothers. <laughs> I'm pointing y'all in the direction of one of these sisters that's yeah. on the stage. So this is who y'all should be paying attention to. Yeah. So again, thank you all uh, for, can, for being here, being a part of this conversation. Can we get some quick uh, oh, okay. final words from yeah. the brothers? Jay, start with you. Yeah, so I just want to encourage the brothers that are here, know that you matter. Know that your life is worth living for. Um, it's, it's tough right now. Thank you. Being a black man. And I also want to encourage Charlemagne to continue to stand in his greatness. Let me tell you something. When you take a stand for something, man, when you're on the front line, you take a lot of hits. See, it's easy to sit behind your phones and sit behind your TVs, but I honor this brother because he took a stand to reveal his scars to the world. So I honor him for that, and I ask that you guys continue to pray for him and support him and all of these brothers. Because I left private practice in May because from March 2020 to May 15th, when I left private practice, I saw 500-plus people for therapy, and I needed a mental health break for myself. So as what Ryan said, there, there's a huge need in the mental health, mental health capacity and especially for black males, because more men are coming, but we don't have men to see them. So brothers, continue to your healing journey, and as always, healing is a journey, and wholeness is the destination. Yes. Um, I just end with a story short of me and my son, and this is for all the men. One day we were training in the basement, and he looked at me, he says, Dad, um, how did you become a great dad when your father wasn't? And I said, I said, son, I simply gave you what I longed for. So as men, we typically lean towards what we lack or live from what we lacked. But I, I tell you, as a, just looking at me now, I want you to desire and to live for or live from what you desire. Live from what you longed for. Don't allow the father wounds to keep you wounded now. Stop allowing your trauma to time travel so you can live fully in the present. And um, again, I just gotta say thank you, brother. I know in your position, 
you know, I talk about black men accepting affirmation a lot. Sometimes we tend to do like lateral play in football where we pass it instead of receiving it. I want you to keep all of this and don't say nothing to us. But I thank you for the man that you've become, who you are becoming, the sacrifices you're making. For you to do what you did on Comedy Central Friday, that needs to be acknowledged. And I just want you to receive that, because you, although you can point to us, it wouldn't be no this without you. And you deserve the affirmation, you deserve the love. And I want you to receive it, because that's the, also a part of healing. Yeah. Thank you, bro. Thank you, Z. Thank you. Thank you, bro. We love you. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, there's a reason why his name is on the top here, man, because you have sacrificed so much for us all, man. One more round of applause for all these amazing brothers up here on stage. A big thank you to you all. We have breakout rooms that are happening. Once again, thank you all for your time.